morning, saints of our Lord, and welcome to Thy Strong Word. I'm your host, Brady Finner, and pastor of Messiah Lutheran Church in Sartell, Minnesota. Thank you for tuning us in this morning on Worldwide KFUO, Christ for you anytime, anywhere. A blessed epiphany season to all of you this Monday, February the 7th, as the light of Jesus shines on us from Matthew chapter 14. Jesus, it's an amazing part of scripture. Right before today, we have the feeding of the 5,000 men plus women and children with only five loaves and two fish. And he, and I love how it says that he was full of compassion and he brought the fullness of mercy to those in need that was such abundance that they even had more left over than you would ever have imagined. But not to be outdone, today he does another miracle that sometimes we, we don't overlook it, but we can definitely misinterpret it to understanding of how he truly, who he truly is and trying to understand also of what this means for us today and what this will mean for us when Christ returns. All of it brings us the fullness of what our king is and what our king does for us then and what he does for us now. So let's dig in. The gifts are ready, ready for you. Thank you to our friends at Lutheran Heritage Foundation for their support of Thy Strong Word. Visit lhfmissions.org for more information. lhfmissions.org. Helping us to be strengthened by God's word this morning, we have back with us Pastor Jason Bredesen of Trinity Lutheran Church in Sacramento, California, and also chaplain in the Air Force Reserves. Pastor Bredesen, welcome back to Thy Strong Word. Thank you, Pastor Fenner, and I appreciate the invitation. It's good to be with you all again. Well, Pastor, tell us what's happening for you, your family, and the work of the saints at Trinity. Here in Sacramento, California, we are continuing to endure the uh, the pandemic, as it were. We are here in Sacramento County. Our mask mandate has never lifted. Uh, we have been masked since the middle of March 2020, and we're still trying to figure life out with that. But uh, God is faithful. Christ has remained faithful through it all, and the congregation is doing um quite well through it all and um, my family too is faring um, quite healthy these days so we're we're in good shape there's there's a lot we could lament about our life in this broken world but thanks be to God we have uh, the word of Christ uh, and the sacraments to sustain us through it and we have the hope of the resurrection and eternal life awaiting us and thanks be to God for that. Now, now, Pastor, as I mentioned, that you are a chaplain in the Air Force Reserves and serve a parish. Can you kind of give us a little bit of an insight of how does that work? That sounds like a lot, but how how does uh do you do you have to go every week? Do you have to go once a year? I mean, how how does this all fit together with the Air Force Reserves in your ministry? Yeah, so I'm the wing chaplain for the 940th Air Refueling Wing at Beale Air Force Base in here in Northern California. I'm what's called a traditional reservist. So one weekend a month, I go up and serve the people of the 940th, the airmen of the 940th, and um, serve them in a, a chaplain role, a pastoral role. And uh, this may surprise you, Pastor Finner, but not everybody in the Air Force is a confessional Lutheran. Um, <laughs> it, it really did surprise me when I signed up, but I'm grateful for it. Uh, it gives me the opportunity to uh, make use of the call that God has given me both in baptism as well as in ordination and the call to the congregation here at Trinity to to serve our nation, to serve the airmen of the 940th for the sake of the gospel. Um, thankfully, uh, the congregation, Trinity, has been incredibly supportive of the role and in their prayers and in their uh, ongoing commitment to um, gifting some of my time to, uh, to the Air Force, to that service, and really uh, taking it up not only as something that Pastor Bredesen goes and does once a, once a month and two weeks a year, but as a um, as a real extension of the mission of the synod, and as the mission of their own uh, work in the Sacramento area, uh, it it uh, presents any number of challenges. And I would um, encourage all of your listeners to please be in prayer, not only for our soldiers, sailors, airmen, 
Marines and, and Coast Guardsmen, but also uh, for, and especially for our chaplain. Uh, the, the work that they do really is um, a gift from the Lord to our nation. And, um, and I got to tell you, as, as a Missouri Synod clergyman and chaplain, um, our people, our men that are serving in that role are second to none. We, we really have a good reputation and a, um, an excellent opportunity. We are well poised to proclaim both law and gospel in a very unique and challenging context. Well, Pastor, as you mentioned this, uh, can you begin our time in asking the Lord's blessings upon our study and to pray for our chaplains and men and women in our military? I'd be pleased to do so. Thank you. We pray. Holy Father, your Son, Jesus Christ, our Lord, came and walked with us and served us and loved us and granted us his strong word to save us in our time of need. Thank you. Thank you so much for the strong word of your Son, Jesus Christ, our Lord. And thank you that you have called men into the office of holy ministry to serve that word of law and gospel to your people, and especially for the chaplain of, um, of the LCMS and all Christian chaplains in the United States Armed Forces, that as they serve for the sake of the gospel, that their ministry would uh, go well and be received faithfully, and that uh, the soldiers, sailors, airmen, and Coast Guardsmen would be served by the commitment of all of the, all of the Christian chaplains, and especially those of the Lutheran Church Missouri Synod. Thank you for Pastor Finnern and everybody listening to this program. May your strong word ever uh, resound in our minds, hearts, lives, and ears that we may be strengthened in love toward you and in love toward the neighbor through Christ our Lord. Amen. Amen. If you have any questions concerning our text that we're studying today or any part of the Gospel of Matthew, send us an email, kfuo at kfuo.org, kfuo at kfuo.org. Pastor, how we've been doing, uh, how we've been starting our studies in the Gospel of Matthew is, first of all, we are trying very hard to slow down to study the Word because we started in December. We'll go all the way until Easter, the week of Easter, after Easter, I should say. And and it is uh, uh, something that we're trying to go slowly through this because we so quickly can just run through the text and, and feel like we accomplished something and not slow down. So what I'll do is I will read 22 through 36, which is our, our text we're studying, and then come back and get your introductory thoughts because, you know, let's be honest, we could probably spend a few hours on this text, don't you think? I would imagine so. There's a good bit in here. It's a, a very meaty, as, as some people would say. So let's begin <laughs> verse 22, and we'll read through verse 36. Reminder to our listeners, we'll be reading from the English Standard Version of Holy Scripture. And it begins, Immediately, Jesus made the disciples get into the boat, and before him, to the others, before him to get to the other side while he dismissed the crowds. And after he had dismissed the crowds, he went up on the mountain by himself to pray. When evening came, he was there alone. But the boat by this time was a long way from the land, beaten by the waves, for the wind was against them. And in the fourth watch of the night, he came to them walking on the sea. But then the disciples saw him walking on the sea. They were terrified and said, It is a ghost. And they cried out in fear. But immediately Jesus spoke to them, saying, Take heart, it is I. Do not be afraid. And Peter answered them, Lord, if it is you, command me to come to you on the water. He said, Come. So Peter got out of the boat and walked on the water and came to Jesus. But when he saw the wind, he was afraid and began to sink. He cried out, saying, Lord, save me. Jesus immediately reached out his hand and took a hold of him, saying to him, O you of little faith, why do you doubt? And when they got into the boat, the wind ceased, and those in the boat worshipped him, saying, Truly you are the Son of God. And when they had crossed over, they came to the land of Gennesaret, 
and the men and the place recognized him. They sent all round to all the region and brought to him all who were sick and implored him that they might only touch the fringe of his garment. And as many as touched it were made well. This is our text today. Pastor, what are your first thoughts before, as we, as we begin to study these great verses? Well, I would look to uh, the wisdom of my undergraduate Hebrew professor, Dr. Kevin Spahn, who, uh, who is often known to be saying context is king. Mm -hmm. Uh, and it, it is so important for us to remember what is going on in, in not only from the passage in Matthew 14, but also what has led us to these events. So, of course, Matthew 1, you have the genealogy and naming of Jesus Christ. Uh, chapter 3, the ministry of John the Baptist, uh, his, his proclamation, his um, calling out of the, the kingdom of God uh, being at hand, and, of course, the baptism and temptation of Christ. You roll right into the Sermon on the Mount, which I have often likened to being uh, Jesus' boot camp, the tearing down of the disciples in order to build them up anew in the way that he sees fit. Chapters 8 and 9, Jesus ministers to all, and we see a, uh, a parallel uh, text to what we have here in John, uh, Matthew 14, and that is the stilling of the storm in chapter 8, verses 23 through 27, where it is the storm that instills the fear upon the disciples, and Jesus calms the waves. Chapter 10 is the sending out of the 12, and as chapter 10 continues, he sends out other missionaries also. In chapters 11 through 12, um, Jesus' teaching really ruffles the feathers of the Pharisees, and the antagonism that they picked up at that point really uh, carries us uh, throughout the Gospel of Matthew, ultimately to his uh, uh, arrest trial, death, and resurrection. And then 13 and 14, Jesus teaches his disciples and all of his people in parables. And um, unfortunately, his cousin meets an, uh, a sad end as John the Baptist is beheaded. And, uh, um, well, you win some, you lose some. And I guess John won, uh, won that one as he entered into the eternal life given to him, promised him. But nonetheless, Jesus is dealing with the grief of the loss of his cousin. And then the feeding of the 5,000 uh, and all of this uh, brings us to our passage today where um, Jesus finds himself, I would think, somewhat spiritually, emotionally exhausted from all of these experiences. The, the strain of ministry and the, the angst of uh, receiving the antagonism of the Pharisees, the grief of uh, losing his cousin, John the Baptist, um, I would imagine weighed heavily on the heart of Jesus. Uh, and, uh, and now we see him going up to the mountains to pray while he sends the disciples on ahead of him in the boat. As we look at the whole context, I really, you, you highlighted it in a, in a wonderful way that, you know, God is very intentional <laughs> about how he addresses his people, continue working through Matthew to show all the connections while not acting as if everything is this hunky dory. And that especially mm -hmm. comes true as we, as we studied last Thursday with pastor Dieter Ding about John the Baptist. And then right after that, uh, one of our colleagues that we know very well, Bob Hiller, just wonderfully mm -hmm. puts together in verse 14, right before our text, about the compassion of Jesus that was full of compassion, and then he fills the people with his gifts. And I thought that that's very helpful for us to, to look at how God addresses his people, how he provides for his people. And then today... You know, like I said at the beginning, not to be all done, you know, one miracle to the other, proving once again what kind of king he is, that he does some other miracles. And so it leads us up to this point almost of an anticipation, what's it going to do next? Which is really, I mean, yeah. that's what makes from here, not quite to the end of Matthew, but 
there's a lot of those moments where you're almost on the edge of your seat, which is why we're slowly going through this. Any other thoughts you have before we dig in? Well, I like what you said about uh, being on the edge of our seats to, to wonder what would be next. Uh, you know, the disciples, they must also have been exhausted, engaged in the ministry with Jesus and witnessing so many um, miracles uh, that, that would just cause one to scratch their head, uh, that the, the creator of all is kind of messing with the creation. Uh, the things that we don't normally um, expect to happen, like 5,000 men being fed with so few uh, loaves of bread and fish, with leftovers, uh, and uh, and of course, in today's uh, passage, we we just see the the water um, availing uh, against them in the boat, but the Christ walking out on the water, uh, and um, it would it would cause uh, no shortage of how. Uh, the question of how do we respond to this. And so let's dig in as, as we hear this, I, I do find it interesting. And I want to hear your thoughts after I read the first few verses is the word immediately is used throughout our reading today. So I, I'm, I'm looking forward to hearing your first thoughts on that because typically, and for you, our listeners, that this is the word that's so, I mean, majority of scripture, it is done in Mark, but today we hear it, I believe it's three times. And what is the significance of that? So just to prepare you right now, Pastor, that's gonna be my first question for you. So I'm gonna help, I'm gonna have you think about that as I read these first few verses. So beginning in verse 22. Immediately, Jesus made the disciples get into the boat and go before him to the other side while he dismissed the crowds. And after he had dismissed the crowds, he went up on the mountain by himself to pray. When evening came, he was there alone. But the boat by the, this time was a long way from the land, beaten by the waves, for the wind was against them. Now, I'm going to stop there just because I think there's a lot of context here. First of all, I'm going to ask you right now, immediately. We hear it three times in our reading today. What, is, is there any significance to that? Did you find anything on that? Or what are your thoughts? Yeah, well, you're right to point out that uh, it is uh, immediately, so to speak, present throughout the Gospel of Mark. And even here in Matthew, as you mentioned, it pops up in our passage today, but it also pops up uh, elsewhere throughout the Gospel of Matthew. And really, what it it it, it Matthew the the or the Holy Spirit through the uh, evangelist Matthew is really smacking up um, smacking us upside the head and saying, "Look, you got to pay attention to this. This is significant. This is important." Immediately, we need to, to drop everything and take notice of what is going on here, because what is followed is, um, is very significant in terms of the life of Jesus and uh, the life of his disciples. So yes, uh, the word immediately is something that ought to cause us to sit up and take notice of what is before us. And even more so, like even even more on the edge of our seat, because if it says immediately, it means that mm -hmm. Jesus is acting. Um, he's going to do more, and he's going to do it, I guess you would say, relatively quickly, which is uh, mm -hmm. um, probably good. We like things getting done quickly, don't we? I mean, you want to get that, that meal <laughs> done quick. You want to get that run done quick, all that stuff. And, and that's what's it happening. It definitely gives a sense of urgency, that's for sure. <laughs> I did find in this that there's, like I said, mostly in Mark, but there's also, it's, it's, it's a major events. Baptism of Jesus, 3, verse 16. Mm -hmm. Call the disciples in chapter 4. Palm Sunday, it references immediately. And the healings of Jesus throughout, oh, a few times, not every time, but a few times, references immediately he went to act. And so that's something for us mm -hmm. to remember. Okay, so our, our ears are perked, our hearts are ready, our eyes are ready to see what happens after that. Um. Uh, kind of break down the beginning of the story. What's happening? You know, I find it really interesting. So it's later in the day, and you've just had a very significant 
uh, uh, happenstance with the feeding of the 5,000, the gathering of the leftovers, and the crowd is still present, even though it's quite late in the day, but now the crowd is satiated. They have had their fill. Um, and, uh, and Jesus immediately makes the disciples get into the boat and go before him to the other side. Now, if I'm a disciple there, I'm wondering, well, okay, well, Jesus, how are you going to get to the other side? Right? Mm-hmm. And and yet, it's, at least in what's before us, we don't see that question being asked. They, they simply follow suit. Jesus is left there with the crowd. The disciples climb into the boat, and they uh, embark upon their passage across um, across the lake. And, uh, and it's then that Jesus, and only then that Jesus dismisses the crowd. So he dismisses and, and sends the disciples off and then says to the crowd, go, go in peace, uh, uh, go your way. And um, I've always been baffled by that, that, that Jesus sends the disciples in the boat without him and there doesn't seem to be any concern for how Jesus is going to join them. Uh, So there they go. And it, you know, that's a good point. I guess I never thought about that. I never thought about that where you're like, do not have asked questions. Maybe they did, but it doesn't tell us that they did. It wasn't a highlight of the story. So I suppose you could look at it a few ways. One, they're naive, which I must be honest, Mm -hmm. I'd probably be naive too. Or they were, you know, <laughs> and and maybe and that they were full of trust that this guy just fed 5,000 people. He doesn't go across the, the, the lake. I'm going to go do it. I'm not going to question. Plus, they're exhausted. So, like, whatever it takes to get yeah. to the next stage, I'm ready to go. But it it is telling for us to ponder a little bit, especially as we look at the rest of the story. Any other thing you want to highlight? Anything else you want to highlight with it so far? Yeah, just the... Uh... The, the the exhaustion of the disciples it had to be there it was late in the day again they just witnessed a significant miracle and uh, I could see how it would be missed uh, when your leader sends you off uh, and there's uh, there isn't uh, concern given or or attention given to uh, his well-being or welfare or how uh, how things are going to progress. Can I share a little story from uh, my Air Force work about yeah. how yeah. I saw some of this happen? So in the Air Force, we're always concerned about our wingman and making sure that our wingman is taken care of. And um, our civil engineering squadron was out uh, doing an exercise one day, exercise being training, training, uh, dealing with a, a scenario that was put forward and um, myself and my master sergeant were there talking to the commander and the vice commander of the squadron and uh, all of the airmen went got on the bus and they were sitting over on the bus which was probably 50 yards away and the four of us were there talking and um, all of a sudden the bus starts to drive away and I look at the commander and I say, well, how, how do you plan? How are you planning to get back? And his back was to the bus and he turned around and he said, well, we're going to get on the bus as it's driving away. <laughs> <laughs> and I said, well, you know, we'd be happy to give you a ride if you'd like, sir. And uh, he graciously accepted. <laughs> and uh, um, on the way back to the squadron building, he was uh, making very clear that he had just instructed the um, the squadron members that it's always a good idea to take care of your wingman, and uh, <laughs> and then uh, they left their commander behind. Uh, so uh, I'm not sure if that's what's happening here with Jesus, but uh, but Jesus obviously had something in mind when he sent the disciples on ahead. Uh, and the disciples, whether it be in their weariness or their uh, faith, um, were a little bit of both, um, determined that uh, that they could leave their Lord behind and, and make way across the lake. 
That is, uh, that's definitely the way we are. <laughs> that story just reminds yeah. us, well, I got a plan. Oh, trust me. I have a plan. What's the plan? I don't know. Uh, that plan didn't work, you know, <laughs> and here we trust that it's very clear. They didn't necessarily have a plan, but the Lord did. And, uh, that's something we have to trust as well. And yeah. so yeah. I do want to bring up one, uh, one word of not concern. It's a, it's a, um, to read this text, we have to be careful not to interpret it in a way that's not, um, that isn't necess- isn't really the way that the scriptures are supposed to be interpreted. So for example, in this one, the disciples are in a boat and there's a storm that surrounds them. And, and we often will try to do what we call eisegesis. How can I force myself into the text? And so then this is text mm-hmm. is about me. So it's kind of like, okay, the disciples were in a storm, you know, I have storms, therefore Jesus helps me in my storms and then blah, 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 blah. Now, I think in, in one sense, that is true. Like we're not denying that, that Jesus comes to us in our sin, in our brokenness and says, take heart. But we don't want to lose sight of that. Let's not focus all day about our storms. Let's focus about Jesus. Um, mm-hmm. and that's one thing that, that we really have to be careful in this text to be very faithful on the main point. Do you have any thoughts on that? That's something I've noticed, but have you noticed anything along those lines? Yeah. Oh, definitely. Uh, it, it is very easy to do just as Peter did and take our eyes off of Christ and focus on ourselves with any given passage of scripture. But, uh, as you reflect on this, yeah, it's, it, as I read this, I'm like, okay, well, I see myself in Peter. I, I can see how a, a guy walking across on a, on the water in the midst of a storm, I'm going to probably be like, yeah, that's probably a ghost and be afraid. Um, and, uh, and like Peter, I'd probably be bold and brash enough to say, yeah, I want to, I want to, I want in on this action and, uh, uh, seek to hop out of the boat as well. Um, yeah, it is important not to allegorize the text and make it about me or seek to find something or put something into it that is not actually there, but to have our eyes boldly and faithfully, uh, and decidedly directed onto Jesus Christ, uh, in this passage and every other passage that is before us. I want to talk more about that on the other side of our break. We are studying Matthew chapter 14 with Pastor Jason Bredesen, and we will be right back. These are the voices of young Lutherans in Mexico City, children who are excited to learn more about their Savior, Jesus. But they need our help, because good Lutheran books for kids in the Spanish language are in short supply in Mexico. To learn how you can help tell Spanish-speaking kids everywhere about Jesus in a language they can understand, go to the Lutheran Heritage Foundation website at lhfmissions.org forward slash Juan 316. Welcome back. We are studying Matthew chapter 14 with Pastor Jason Bredesen of Trinity Lutheran Church in Sacramento, California. Now, Pastor, once again, we want to keep our eyes on Jesus as we look at this text. And so the the basic context is Jesus is walking on water. Um, um, Actually, no, we haven't got to that point yet. I just let it out of the bay. Okay, I I, I made a mistake there. I'm too excited to get into this because he says immediately, I thought we were already there. So I'm just going to read 25 through 27. Are we, are we good to go? Are we ready? Can I just uh, point out the, the the significance of Jesus going up on the hillside to pray? Yeah, I, please do, please. I love that. Um, and and how important it is to uh, to engage in a life of worship. Uh, for us, not to certainly uh, get eisegetical on us, as you offered us that um, <laughs> fair warning, but uh, but Jesus certainly uh, not only to um, to engage with his Father, but also to model a significant life of worship for us to um, 
to go up on the mountain and pray uh, and to uh, to engage with our Heavenly Father in a life of prayer. One interesting um, study that I have done is John Kleinig's uh, spirituality series that came out, I want to say mid-2000s. And in that study, you know, he just does a wonderful job of highlighting prayer throughout the Bible and the, the prayer in the New Testament and Jesus giving us his prayer. And then one of the highlights he has in, in one of those studies by Dr. John Kleinig, who we've had on the study, um, that he, he wrote down all the times that Jesus went by himself to pray. And it was quite eye-opening when you actually just write down all the times that Jesus goes by himself to pray. Now, maybe this is a little bit of ice of Jesus, but it's definitely in the text, is if Jesus is going to go pray, guess what we should be doing? Mm-hmm. What, are you, what are your thoughts? Always good to follow the leader. <laughs> Very good. <laughs> now, all right, here we go again. Uh, any Anything else you want to highlight before we move on to the to the next part of the story? Um. No, I, I'm I'm ready to get going. Let's, let's do it. Let's immediately jump in. Immediately. Here we go. <laughs> and in the fourth watch <laughs> of the night, verse 25, Jesus came to them walking on the sea. But when the disciples saw him walking on the sea, they were terrified and said, it is a ghost. And they cried out in fear. But immediately Jesus spoke to them saying, take heart, it is I. Do not be afraid. So the next, uh, you know, the, the other shoe has dropped. And what, what, is, what is happening here, these verses? Oh, this is so good, Pastor Finner. I just love this. So the, the boat, uh, and, and uh, I got this from our uh, seminary professor, the venerable Dr. Jeff Gibbs. And uh, I think we should offer that title to him, the venerable. <laughs> he's, he's well deserving of it. Um, he makes the point that... Um, you know, the, the vague language here of uh, being a long way off is likely that they are quite a, a, a couple miles out. And uh, that the storm that they're experiencing, unlike the storm in Matthew 8, this is not so overwhelming that it places them in fear. Their fear in this passage is not from the storm. The fear is induced by Jesus walking on the water out to them. Uh -huh. they, these guys were capable sailors. Uh, they have lived, many of them have lived their life on the lake and had no problem um, making their way through the storm. It just happened to be a nuisance to them. It, was, it, made, it made sailing difficult, but it was not imperiling the way it was in chapter 8. And, uh, and it is the, uh, the Lord's presence walking on the water that it stills fear on them. Uh, and I would say deservedly so. Uh, mm -hmm. You know, I'm in the Air Force, so boats are kind of foreign to me. But I know that if I were out uh, in the middle of a, a large sea, a large lake, and things were rough, and it was the middle of the night, uh, that fourth watch, would be kind of between 3 a.m. and 6 a.m. Uh, and all of a sudden, in the midst of this uh, rough sea, here comes this guy walking out to the boat. I'm not sure that I wouldn't have a different response. In fact, I am quite sure that, that the glory of the Lord being shown in Jesus walking on the water would instill such fear in anybody that that it would it would cause great concern to uh, to understate it a fair amount uh, I look at the ways in which the glory of the Lord is shown in scripture uh, just this past Sunday Isaiah the vision at his calling in Isaiah 6 mm. his response is uh, oh boy I'm gonna die now that's a paraphrase granted but um, but it's not an unfair paraphrase either. And uh, you look at the way that um, the shepherds respond at the Annunciation of the birth of Christ when the angels appear. 
uh, and uh, they they fall on their face. Uh, John, even in the Revelation, uh, when the angel speaks uh, and points to the slain lamb, his response is to fall on his face as though dead. And we think of the glory of the Lord as something that's bright and shiny and um, and desirable, but um, you know, kavod in Hebrew really is a burdensome weight. And any time the Lord shows up in glory in Scripture, it induces utter fear, fear uh, that uh, makes one feel as though they are dead, if not wish they were dead. And here Jesus is walking on the water, displaying the glory uh, of his divinity uh, in the miracle, really induces that kind of fear on them as well and renders a bit of an anti-confession from them. And I got that word also from the venerable Dr. Jeff Gibbs, Mm -hmm. an anti-confession. It's a ghost. Uh, (laughs) Not a, not an unfair rendering. Uh, They're terrified. They're terrified. And I would say deservedly so. And you read the anti-confession. This is not Peter saying you are the Christ, the son of the living God. This is, Hey, there's, there's a ghost. Like, oh, that's not even close to the right thing, you know? Um, right. Yeah. And it is interesting, especially in this text, which is helpful for like I was talking about with the eyes of Jesus, is that we typically act like, oh, it's a storm they're afraid of, when no, it was Jesus they were afraid of. I mean, this right. is a healthy, in some senses, a healthy fear, but then a wrong fear also because of how they described him. Um, but then verse 27 another immediately. Uh, and so how, yes. how does Jesus respond to this anti-confession? Oh man, it, it, the, the fear is there, the anti-confession is there, and immediately. Jesus does not waste time and he does not mince words. Immediately Jesus spoke to them saying, take heart, it is I. I like to share with uh, Trinity, my congregation, that, you know, I can I can tell them all day long, hey, don't worry about things. It'll be okay. And, you know, they may or may not uh, hear that and respond to that. Uh, and it, my word is simply that. It's just, it's just the spoken word. But when Christ speaks, that is a performative word. I mean, the word of this show, Pastor Finner, and I strong word it cleaves the darkness it it does stop it does what it says it will do and so when jesus says take heart it is i do not be afraid that is the peace that surpasses all understanding that guards the disciples hearts and minds in that same jesus christ who is walking to them on the water uh, as Paul uh, rightly reflects in Philippians, uh, I just think that this, this beautiful, strong word of Jesus is doing exactly what it says it is doing. Uh, they are taking heart. They have no choice but to take heart and to recognize the lordship of Jesus and the fear is driven from them by Jesus himself. What a, what a beautiful picture. It reminds me of the words of the angels. If it says, do not be alarmed. You seek Jesus who was crucified. He has risen. He is not here. So it's that mm-hmm. same, that same, that same um, language that reminds you that do not be afraid. Why? Because Jesus in that context is not here per se, but he is here because he's alive. And here Jesus mm-hmm. is here, right here, and right now, I did find it interesting too, is when he says, it is I, it, it connects mm-hmm. us, uh, ego, a, a, my, a, a, me, uh, in, in yeah. Greek, where it's the same language used as Exodus three fourteen, where he says, well, mm-hmm. Moses says, well, who should I tell him has sent me? I am right. who I am. And that's a really powerful language there too, that you know that the disciples would have at least maybe in reflection thought, oh my goodness, there's a connection there. There's a connection yeah. to, to the burning bush. What are your thoughts on that? 
Yeah, well, ego e me, and you look at that from the standpoint of the Gospel of John, ego e me, I am, I am the door, I am the good shepherd, uh, any of the I am, I am the bread of life, any of those I am statements really all do go back to that call of Moses, the burning bush, who who shall I tell him send me, sent me, and uh, uh, tell them I am sent me. And we know that then uh, moving forward in the Old Testament, any time we see in English the word Lord in all capital letters, that's the covenant name of God, Yahweh, uh, and 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 it is the 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 great name of the Lord, uh, and so when Jesus lays claim to that by saying "Ego a me," whether it be here or in the Gospel of John or wherever else, uh, he's saying, "I am, I am Yahweh, I am the covenant God." that created and sustained Israel all throughout their life. And I am now here in the person to do the work of the Messiah. Uh, So anytime anyone tells any of your listeners, Hey, you know, Jesus never said he's God. (laughs) Well, that's kind of why the Pharisees thought to have him put to death is because they knew exactly what he was saying when he said, they go, a me. I am Yahweh. Uh, he is the Lord. He is the covenant God of Israel. And uh, and they knew it. The Pharisees knew it. And here in the boat, the disciples very clearly not only witnessed it in action, but they also witnessed it in his title, I am, uh, and, and the word that he spoke the performative word, do not fear. So as we look at this, like you said, it's a performative word. It wasn't just saying, hey, hey, don't worry about it. I'm in your presence. I mean, he's actually making this happen, taking their fear upon himself. And then from here, we have a response from Peter, which he has a tendency to do that in the Bible, right? He's in the boat. He sees Jesus. (laughs) He responds. But is there? I just want to make sure, is there anything else you want to highlight between 22 in verse 27. You know, just that Jesus's response is immediate. Um, he doesn't waste any time. He sees their fear, acknowledges it, and says, no, you don't need to fear. Uh, I am I am here. I am. And, uh, and because I am here with you, uh, there is every reason and ability to take heart. So as they take heart, We hear, well, the next step in the story of Peter, verse 28. And Peter answered Jesus, Lord, if it is you, command me to come to you on the water. And he said, come. So Peter got out of the boat and walked on the water and came to Jesus. I wanted to stop there because we quickly get to the next piece. And then we, you know, we, we speak about Peter and his response and everything. But I think this is a very interesting part because I don't know if I've always realized that it is Peter who says, Lord, if it's you, come, let me come out to you. And then Jesus says that one single word, come. Yeah. And I think that's significant. Um, any thoughts you have? Well, first of all, I don't fault Peter in any way. Uh, having, having been uh, given the peace of God which surpasses all understanding that's guarding his heart and his mind in Christ and given the opportunity to do something pretty spectacular I I don't know that I wouldn't try and jump out of the boat myself (laughs) against my better judgment because I I have a rough understanding of how physics works but uh, when the creator of all is standing on the water and and I have the opportunity to ask. I don't know that I would ask any differently. Yeah, absolutely. Um, absolutely. So I, I, yeah, I really don't fault him for asking the question. But yes, uh, that 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 word come, uh, the the invitation of Christ. And when I first looked at this passage in preparation for our time together today, it hearkened to me Matthew eleven. Yeah, where Jesus says, "Come to me." You who are weary and burdened, I will give you rest. Take my yoke upon you and learn from me, for I am gentle and lowly at heart. 
for my yoke is easy and my burden is light. Uh, now, it's a, obviously a very different context and a, a different invitation, as it were, but but the word come is so significant there. And, and Peter Peter's boldness in in the request uh, is is a beautiful thing in itself, an expression of faith, um, and uh, and the invitation come, come to me. And that's I mean, how could we not see the connection? Because here he says, "Take heart, do not be afraid." In Matthew eleven, mm-hmm. he says, "Come to me, all who are weary and heavy laden, I will give you rest." So we yeah. we we receive a beautiful picture of how this king is going to operate, that he's going to be, you know, I, I can guarantee King Herod was not going to offer um, rest to his people. You know, I can guarantee that Pilate's goal was not to give rest to the people as governor. Um, it, it, was not, it was not the goal. That's not the goal of all of this. But for Jesus, it is. And not only that, but then he comes to them, right, immediately, and then yeah. now he invites Peter to come to him. And then he starts walking on water. I mean, the, the, the irony of, of Peter, the name is Rock, and he's yeah. trying to walk on water. I mean, it's just the, the dichotomy is incredible <laughs> to think about. The irony is thicker than anything you can imagine. So um, I, I love that <laughs> part. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. Hey, don't think, Peter. <laughs> <laughs> don't think. Don't think about your name. That's exactly true. Yeah. Right. Um, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> in in John chapter 21, this is after Jesus' resurrection, like I mentioned before, that he appeared to his disciples by the sea, and he tells them to go fishing on the other side. And there, Peter, realizing it is the Lord, does not ask, but just jumps in the water and goes. Right, you yeah. Know? <laughs> <laughs> yeah, he, he jumps right in, doesn't yep, he? Yeah, absolutely. Up to him. Yeah. <laughs> so, and, and, and there, in that passage that you're referring to, receive the blessed absolution and the the uh, the command to, to go and feed the sheep yeah. and the flock. Yeah. Gosh, what a beautiful gift. It, it really is. And, th- and that's where, that's why I wanted to focus on this part, because the connection here and post-resurrection just, just shows us um, the dichotomy of coming to Jesus and, and, and our eyes fixed on Jesus and everything that's there. Um, that is so important to all of us in our Christian walk with him. So, Pastor, I want to read verse 30 um, because this is, uh, this is the change of the story. So, uh, verse 30. But when he saw the wind, he was afraid. Beginning to sink, he cried out, Lord, save me. To, to not to go look at this too long, but why did he start sinking? I mean, what, once again, he's the rock. I mean, this is kind of how it works, but... But in this, it makes an emphasis. Why did he start start to sink? Yeah, uh, well, you know, the context again. He is, he is his fear is quelled as he gives the anti confession, and uh, then makes the request, "Let me come to you." And uh, and Jesus says, "Come," and he hops out of the boat, and he's walking on the water, and. And his all this time, his eyes are fixed on Jesus. Uh, we can grab that from the text. But then, of course, you know, uh, um, he, he's walking on water. So what are you going to do? Like, whoa, this is pretty incredible. And you take your eyes off Jesus. And I'd be curious to know how quickly he began to think. I would think it would be pretty fast. Uh, anyone who has ever tried to run across the top of a swimming pool on the uh on the back of the floaties and that sort of thing knows that you're not going to get very far, very fast. Right. Right. Um, except to the bottom of the pool. And, uh, and so, yeah, he starts thinking and, uh, and cries out, uh, Lord save me in the narthex of Trinity. We have a, a, a artistic depiction of this. And oh. in the good German, Peter is crying out hair hilt. You know, Lord, help, uh, or or Mister. You know, Lord, hair, hair, hill, and um, mm. just the the cry once again of fear, uh, of needing salvation. I am 
I have found myself in a predicament that I cannot save myself from. And Salvation he, is found in no other name. And this is, uh, how do you say it? We could spend all day criticizing him for being distracted by the wind, but how much are, you know, <laughs> we're, we're distracted by a whole lot less than wind that could threaten yeah. our lives. You <laughs> know. Right. Um, Facebook. I'm distracted by Facebook. <laughs> Forget the win. Exactly. <laughs> and so he he says words of of faith, but it really just reminds me. Uh, I believe how my unbelief is the words that we hear in mm -hmm. scripture, and I think that really relates to us here about that. And like you said, I, I do you do wonder. You do wonder. Did he make it five steps, twenty steps? Was he like really near <laughs> Jesus or what, whatever it might have been? It didn't matter because he did definitely keep his eyes off Christ, which points us to Hebrews, you know, looking to Jesus, the author and perfecter of yeah. our faith. Yeah. So let's mm -hmm. continue on verses 31 through 33. Jesus immediately reached out his hand and took hold of him, saying to him, Oh, you of little faith, why do you doubt? Why did you doubt? And when they got into the boat, the wind ceased. And those in the boat worshipped him, saying, Truly, you are the Son of God. So we see the word immediately again. What does he immediately do? Yeah. Oh, well, he responds to the cry of uh, salvation that Peter offers and, uh, and doesn't waste any time. Immediately he reaches out, takes hold of him, and saves him. Uh, I, I, man, he doesn't waste any time, does he? Immediately, he reaches out and saves him. And I think it's so important to recognize the, the touch that he gives. He, he reaches out his hand. Uh, he is this corporeal being, this, this human man in his body reaches out to save another human being with touch. And, uh, and and does so by taking hold of him in a very real, tangible and physical manner. Uh, and he does it. He does it again. He just doesn't waste time. He just reaches out, grabs him. And what is the 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 proclamation he gives? So you know we see that grace where he grabs a hold of of Peter, pulls him up, and then he says these words: "Oh, you of little faith, why did you doubt?" What is Jesus mm -hmm. doing there? Yeah, <laughs> I, I can only imagine Peter's response like, well, you know, it was kind of something I've never done before. And, <laughs> and uh, <laughs> you know, there are any there are any number of reasons one can give in that situation for having little faith and doubting, not the least of which is, you know, you're walking on water, something that is physically not possible right right <laughs> i'd say it's not a not a, uh, a illegitimate uh, concern there uh except that peter has been walking with jesus for any length of time now he had witnessed the feeding of the five thousand five thousand he had witnessed them coming out on the water he had witnessed the reception of the calming of his own fears uh and and the distilling of um, of uh, his his anxiety over the walking of Jesus on the water. He has seen any number of healings, miracles, uh, the casting out of demons. Uh, if anyone should know better, it should be Peter uh, and the other disciples. But uh, Jesus, in saying this, oh, you of little faith, why did you doubt? He's not saying, uh, you know, uh, you need to, you, you are uh, not a, you are not my disciple. No, he's saying, you've seen me, you know how I operate, you know who I am. Um, there is no need to be fearful and to doubt my care and ministry for you. And this is where it, like you said, it's obvious. Well, I don't, I, I, I doubt because I'm on a lake. I mean, this is not normal. You know, <laughs> come on, buddy. You know, but he didn't respond that way. 
they simply got into the boat. The wind ceased, yeah. which is really not, I mean, it's not the main point of this narrative that Matthew gives to us, but it does show his power over that. And then it gets to yeah. the end where they say, truly, you are the son of God. To this point, the only ones that really say so strong words are demons, the devil, who yeah. says, what do you mm -hmm. have to do with us, O son of God or son of David? We had a little bit of a glimpse of this in Matthew 12, where they're kind of like, oh boy, this guy's pretty good. Could it be the son of David? Mm -hmm. um, but mm -hmm. even there, it's a question mark. Here, they say it boldly. They know that there is no other name under heaven by which men might be saved. You, truly, mm -hmm. you are the son of God. What is the significance yes. of that bold confession that they have? Well, uh, you know, you, you're right to recognize that this is really kind of the one of them. It is the very first time in Matthew that they're really grasping hold of who this guy is. And then you look back at eight and the calming of the storm when they're out in the middle of the lake where, where the storm is what causes their fear. And, uh, and geez, they wake Jesus and say, hey, we need some help here, buddy. Can, can you grab a bucket? start bailing us out and he he calms the storm and there in eight chapter eight their response is yeah who is this guy right what sort of man is this and now in chapter 14 as jesus walks out on the water to them that is what instills the fear in them they are calmed peter makes the request to come he steps out and Jesus, at, at the request of, at the, the cry for salvation from Peter, reaches out, grabs hold of him. While they're still in the midst of the stormy sea, he says, oh, you of little faith, why do you doubt? And then they get in the boat, and then the storm is deep. And there they are in the boat, and, and they worship. And they worship, and they give that beautiful confession. This is the guy. Truly, this is the son of God, we know, we recognize, we recognize that, that, that when Jesus says, hey, go, a me, when he says, I am, that, that he is someone who is to be reckoned with. And we recognize that. Pastor, right now, we're not going to be able to get through the rest of our text because we are out of time. So here we go. Oh, man. Pastor Jason Bredesen <laughs> of Trinity Lutheran Church in Sacramento, California, giving us God's strong word from Matthew chapter 14. Pastor Bredesen, thank you for bringing us his gifts. Thank you. I really appreciate the opportunity, Pastor Finner. God bless you and all of your listeners. I'm your host, Brady Finner, and pastor of Messiah Lutheran Church in Sartell, Minnesota. Thank you for joining us and the Lord keep you safe in the palm of his hand. <laughs>